Hey guys and girls, Grey Hunter here with another Warhammer Lore video, the first of the in-depth faction looks where this episode's focus is going to be Bretonia, the land of chivalry and knights. These guys are first on the in-depth faction video list mainly because they always, always, always get the shaft, probably because of how similar they are to the historical concepts and the legends that they come from. But despite that, they're actually one of my favourite factions. They have the dubious distinction of having the most outdated army book in play with the current edition of Warhammer Fantasy, holding the place the Daemon Hunters held in Warhammer 40,000 until Matt fucking Ward ruined everything. Despite this, they're not completely buggered as they've still got strengths and they can win if they are played right. But I do digress, this video is to explore the lore of the great realm of Bretonia. So first up is Origins. Located to the west of the Empire, the land that would become Bretonia had once been where the High Elves had located some of their colonies back in the day where they actually ventured outside of Ulthuan. Despite the Elves leaving, the city still stood, and a number of them were claimed by the human settlers who drifted over from the east. These settlers, though, were later displaced and conquered by the tribe of the Bretoni, who were the forefathers to the Bretonians of modern-day Warhammer. Warlike and master horsemen, they migrated westwards with the tribes that would later form the Empire, although they went further west over the Grey Mountains into Bretonia. When Sigmar actually forged the Empire, he did offer a seat at the table to the Bretoni, but they were a little bit too proud to submit to another, and they said, no, go away. So around 700 years after Sigmar Heldenhammer, saviour of the universe, united the Empire and wandered off to fight chaos in the vogue of the legend of Romulus, Bretonia was a pretty terrible place. Orcs and goblins wandered the land, pillaging and getting into fights just for the fun of it, because you know, they're orcs and goblins. Luckily for this besieged realm of men, one of the lords of the land, Gilly le Breton, I'm gonna keep saying it like that, so live with it, said, Hell with that man, and rode out on a mighty steed to smite the evil plaguing his home. Having succeeded in cleansing his own territory, he decided to double down and go for liberating all of Bretonia, because, you know, if you're gonna do something right, you might as well do the whole thing. Gathering together his little companions and the rest of the guys that he'd fought with to liberate his own homeland, he set out on this quest heading for the Forest of Shalons. As he and his best of friends made their peace with the world and prepared for death and glorious battle against the numberless hordes, the Lady of the Lake appeared next to them, because they'd camped next to a lake, you see, and he gave them her blessing, giving them renewed strength and purity and creating the first of her Grail Knights, although these guys were later called Grail Companions because they were the first, you get the idea. Thus urged on, Gillies and his battle brothers went forth the next day and they killed the bejesus out of the orcs, unfurling the banner of the Lady afterwards and basking in the rejoicing cries of local peasantry. Having won what would be called the first of the twelve great battles of uniting, they gathered more noble knights as they went, winning more battles against the hordes of evil, including one on the edge of Athelorn, which earned Gillies and company the tolerance of the Wood Elves and the Forest Spirits. On they went until Gillies and his brave companions numbered fourteen, and they made ready for a last great battle against the combined hordes of evil they'd defeated in the previous eleven grand fights. Naturally, they kicked ass and took names, and the army book puts this in an entirely appropriate setting Quote, so you just know how badass they were. The piles of the dead were stacked like unto mountains, and searing pyres burnt the slain enemy such that night was turned to day for a season and more. So yeah, pretty manly. Having succeeded in their glorious quest, Gillies is named king, and the people did rejoice, etc, etc. But as with all great United stories, Gillies wasn't going to have an happy ending, was he? Nuh-uh, nuh-uh. He gets mortally wounded in battle 17 years later by an arrow or some other such missile weapon, which leads the Bretonian nobility to say that all missile weapons are cheating and dishonourable, like that annoying kid at school you knew who couldn't accept that he'd lost at a game. Gillies gets taken to a nearby lake and popped on a boat by the Fae Enchantress, who's the emissary of the Lady of the Lake and taken away to the Isle of Wonder to live eternally with her. And in true Arthurian form, we are assured that in the darkest, direst hour of need, Bretonia's warrior king will return to champion the cause. Who will succeed him isn't a simple thing, however. His son Louis heads out to find the Lady of the Lake himself, basically to prove that he too is just as good as dear old dad's companions who fought in the Twelve Battles, which starts the tradition of the questing knight. Don't worry about that, it becomes more relevant later, I'll explain it. He succeeds in his quest and returns home a few years later in triumph, being crowned by the Fae Enchantress herself, and riding his father's code of chivalry firmly into the culture of Bretonia. The knights of the land take to this ideal with gusto, setting out on their own quests and the like. After over a hundred years, get this, a hundred years, the last of Gilly's companions dies, but the tradition of the Grail Knight has been born, where questing knights who succeed in being as badass and pure a spirit as the original companions get to fight the Green Knight to prove themselves worthy to drink from the Grail of the Lady and become a less high-leveled version of the original Grail companions. 
So now we jump forward a little bit in history. 470 years after Gillies dies, the Sultan Jafar of Araby invades Astalia to the south of Bretonia. Astalia, if you recall from the general law video, is the pre-reconquista Spain analogy. Astalia calls for aid and the Bretonians, along with the Empire, jumping on the chance for glory and honour, answer the call. King Louis the Righteous and his knights curb stomp the Arabian armies, pushing them back across the ocean to their homeland. The Bretonians then launch a crusade to Araby itself, fighting for three years in what's fairly insignificant battles, before facing Jafar himself at the Battle of al Haik. Jafar calls upon the spirits of the desert land, but despite this, and despite being outnumbered by a large margin, the flower of Bretonian chivalry wins the day. Because of course they do, they are glorious, they are righteous. Unlike the Crusaders of our history, they don't bother to set up a state there, deciding it's too hostile of a land in both weather and people, instead looting what they can take and carrying it back to Bretonia. Back on the continent though, a second army had been raised, but on news of the great victory, they took out their anger at missing what was, literally, the best fight since Gillies did his thing, no really, and they fought the orcs and goblins in the area that would become the realms of the border princes. This righteous wrath against the Greenskins earned them the praise and nod of approval from the dwarves who lived around the area, seeing the Bretonians as a kindred spirit of sorts, despite them being simple manlings, who held honour in high regard as the dwarves did themselves. Some of the knights actually stayed on in the area, raising mighty castles to rule over the land, and they'd become the border princes, some of them. Of course, the border princes is a thing we will discuss in another video. Also around this time, a vampiric knight naming itself the Red Duke terrorises the land, before being killed by the king himself, however this is not the last time that the undead and other such foulness is to trouble the realm of Bretonia. Dun dun dun! The Bretonians also went on a few more crusades over their history, though the first one to Araby is held up as the greatest crusade of all time. Picture Kanye West if you will. They even crusaded to Nehekara one time, though the lore doesn't really expand on why they did that. Perhaps based off of the stories heard in Araby or something like that, but you know, they never explained it in the lore, your guess is as good as mine. They also have this sort of super crusade, I guess you could call it, called an Errantry War, and the name comes from the lowest tier of Bretonian knighthood, the Knight Errant, who earns his spurs and becomes a knight of the realm by performing an errand, usually the recovery of a relic or the slaying of some great beast or, you know, very Arthurian thing. When the king declares an Errantry War, a knight can earn his spurs by great feats of arms in wartime, however. In the lore, there are two of significance mentioned, one taking place 1,223 years after Gillies dies, led by King Lewin the Orc Slayer. How cool of a name is that? King Lewin Orc Slayer, who expands the borders of Bretonia significantly into the land the Orcs has held around the existing duchies, so they don't get a whole ton of extra land, but they get a little bit. The other Errantry War that is mentioned took place in 1442, and was also against the Orcs, who had invaded the area that was the Border Princes. At first, all went well, the knights drove the Orcs before them, but sheer numbers of greenskins wore down the population of Bretonia, and the war went on for 60 years before King Philippe declared an end to the silliness after the Flower of Chivalry was wiped out at Dread Pass. Bretonians, being a proud lot, giving the elves a run for their money with the size of the stick up their collective asses, didn't take this defeat well, and they'd probably have wiped themselves out trying to avenge it. So, yeah. Not always the cleverest, this set of proud knights. Jumping back a little bit in the history lesson for a moment to the undead and other such things, it's time to bring up vampires and such again, woo! In 703, the dead rise across the land as Nagash returns to the world, though this is not actually known at the time, and the knight becomes known as the Knight of the Restless Dead. The Red Duke too, although long dead, returns, but he's chased off into the Forest of Shalons, and there's no real evidence to say that he's alive or not, he's just kind of mentioned twice in the lore and forgotten about. In 835, the Red Pox, which is basically Warhammer's version of the Black Death, swept across the land, decimating the populace. The Skaven as well emerged from the depths and attempted to destroy the weakened realm, though the elves of Athel Lauren came to the aid of the Bretonians, throwing these bastards back into the Under Empire. During this time, however, a duchy of Bretonia fell into true corruption. The duchy in question was Muslion, a land of swampland and a place told of in horror stories. The dead were said to walk the land, and the night to be filled with the sounds of the otherworldly. Yeah. Just a little bit creepy. The swampland that it was built on made it impossible to actually bury the dead, so the immense graveyards of tombs built above the ground took on an air of being towns unto themselves. Strangely, though, this was actually a place that one of Gilly's companions came from, Landwin, and he was held up as being the epitome of knighthood and the sole bright spot in Musilian's history. At the time, though, of the plague, the duke of the place, Merovic, and his knights were left untouched by the plague that swept across the land, and he rode to break the siege of Brion and to aid the elves and the knights of the Duchy of Paravon. He and his knights, clad in their pitch black plate, yeah, 
pitch black plate. They're, they don't just come from a place that's known for being creepy. They wear something that makes them look creepier. He and his knights broke the back of the Skaven Horde, though they were said to reveal far too much in the killing, disgusting their virtuous and honourable comrades. So I'll leave that to you. Is he a follower of corn? You know, bloody death? Or is he a vampire? I don't know. But even this could have been passed off, you know, as a one-time thing, if he hadn't then invited his fellow dukes and the king back to a victory feast at his home in Mazillion. Dinner was served by shambling servants who looked as if dead, and criminals were impaled on the walls around the hall. Merovic took offence at the horrified attitude of his fellows, claiming that his hospitality was being dishonoured, and accusing the king of plotting against him and being jealous. Because, you know, it had nothing to do with the corpses hanging from the walls. The king, of course, went, oh hell no you didn't, son, and challenged Merovic to a duel. Although not noted as having been a vampire, Merovic responded by ripping the king's throat out with his bare hands and drinking his blood from a cup. Although he was killed later when the Fey Enchantress and the new king led a crusading force to cleanse the land and bring him to justice, he fought a hard fight before he died. 300 years later, a descendant of Merovic attempts to claim the throne, imprisoning the Fey Enchantress and claiming to have found that which was most sacred to Bretonia the grail of the lady itself. His treachery was revealed, however, and the king once more put the duchy to the sword, this time learning the damned lesson of the past and abolishing Musilion as a duchy. Three years later, the Red Pox makes a reappearance, this time only affecting Musilion, killing everyone in the duchy. The land was given over to the dead and became a land which no one would willingly go to. In the reign of Luan Leoncor, however, the current king, a claimant has appointed themselves the Duke of Musilion, ruling over this realm of death and horror. Heinrich Kemmler, too, the so-called Lichmaster, plagues the Bretonians, terrorising the Duchy of Quintels on a regular basis. Most recently, having repeatedly attacked the Abbey of Les Maisontelles, he was hunted by the Duke Tancred, though he escaped and after a long game of cat and mouse, the two opponents battled each other. Tancred was killed at the Battle of Montfort Bridge, although Kemmler did have to retreat in the forest to hide. And now we move on to the Knights of the Land. The Knights of Bretonnia are worth mentioning quickly, I promised I would explain the whole questing thing. We've gone over it a little bit in the history section, but I'll lay it out here for the ease of understanding as well. Knights Errant are basically the guys at the bottom. They're out to earn their spurs, they're basically squires, and they need to complete a test which is usually the recovery of a relic or the killing of a great beast. Knights of the Realm are your basic knights, these guys earn their spurs, and they're the core of any Bretonian army that rides out on the field. Questing knights have given up the lance, and they carry big, massive, fuck-off hammers, axes, or swords on a quest to find the Lady of the Lake and prove themselves worthy of drinking from the Grail. And the Grail knights are those questing knights who have actually achieved their goal, having sucked from the Grail, and they now protect the sacred places of the Lady. Basically, if you're a Grail knight, you're the best of the best of the best. As with all the factions of Warhammer, several special named heroes appear on the tabletop, providing each army with a set of specialized warriors to lead them into battle. With the age of the Bretonian army book, they're not as effective as they once were, but their lore is still interesting, so this bit will also contain the modern history of Bretonia. The most recent king, Luan Leoncor, is supposed to be descended from Gillies himself, and it's said that he actually embodies the best of the original Grail companions. He's done quite well for himself in the 22 years of his rule, reinvigorating the values of chivalry and martial discipline. Notably though, in the End Times fluff, he fights a civil war against his bastard son, the totally not a Mordred clone, Malabord, Oh, and his bastard son is a vampire, for the shits and giggles, supported by Arkan the Black. Yeah, that guy. Lewin is believed to be killed, but he's not really. There's a little bit of a gap here in the lore, presumably to be covered by an army book if they make a new one, but he returns in the next book of the End Times as the High Paladin of Bretonia, and we'll get to the title change in a sec. He's leading a crusader army of Bretonian knights to relieve the besieged imperial capital of Altdorf, murdering his way through the beastmen attacking Athel Lauren as he goes, because, you know, he's amazing like that. He does save Altdorf, but at the cost of his own life. He manages to kill Kugath Plaguefather, a Nurgle demon, before he goes down using holy water of the lady to melt this son of a bitch. Unfortunately for him, Festus the Leech Lord was also around and murderizes him. He dies in the Temple of Shyala, though the good news is he appears to be ascending to what's essentially godhood and becomes the consort of the lady. Husband to a goddess isn't half bad for a career ending. The Green Knight, a warrior spirit who's the final challenge for a questing knight attempting to seek out the Lady of the Lake and drink from the Grail. He's characterized by his ivy green colored armor and the grim intonation of none shall pass. 
He is said to appear from green mist that emerges from the earth and wield an ethereal blade. His sword's actually given a name in the army book, the Dolores Blade, which just sounds badass, if anything does, and it glows with a strange light. He's not solely for the purpose of challenging questing knights, however, he also protects the sacred sites of the Lady, destroying evil that sullies them. The Beastmen even have a nickname for him, he's the Soul Killer, because he's murdered the bejesus out of so many of them over the centuries. The identity of the Green Knight wasn't actually confirmed until the end times, where it was revealed that he actually is Gilly Le Breton reborn. Riding in to save the day when Malibud, not Mordred, seemingly kills Luan, he reclaims his throne as what seems to be essentially a god king of Bretonia, their version of Sigmar. His first act as reborn king of Kikasri is to lop the head of Malibord, not Mordred, off, and he cleanses the land of most of the undead hanging around it and makes Luan, when he returns from whatever it was he was doing, his high paladin. Unfortunately, in the latest End Times books, passing reference is made to Bretonia being overrun by Skaven, those rat bastards, so Gillies and the fate of his faction is kind of up in the air until Games Workshop says yay or nay about them continuing to survive. The Fey Enchantress. This lady is amazing. She basically serves as an emissary of the Lady of the Lake and as an advisor to the king. If the king doesn't have a clear heir, she picks the next one, and she's even dethroned a king before, ordering the Grail Knights to banish him from the realm. When she's not advising or playing Kingmaker, she's responsible for picking up the kids who are sensitive to the arcane, and taking them on a magic carpet ride to teach them how to use their great power. Only the girls return, though, as prophetesses and damsels, to serve as the wizards for Bretonia. What happens to the guys, you ask? Well, we don't know, and maybe we don't want to. She also rode into battle on a unicorn named Silveron, which as far as I know is the only unicorn in the entire Warhammer fantasy universe, and she was protected by a unit of Grail Knights. Whether or not there's been only the one Fey Enchantress, or the title is passed down, hasn't been clarified, and the current one is a lady who's totally not Morgan Le Fay, being that she's Morgiana Le Fay. Unfortunately for her, she's a little bit busy being dead, having been first turned into a vampire by Manfred von Karstein. She tries to use her vampiric powers of persuasion on Arkan the Black, which allows her to get close enough to take his knife and kill herself with it, only for him to bring her back to unlife about five minutes later. Unfortunately for her, being turned into a vampire by von Karstein isn't the last of her worries, as she was sacrificed as one of the nine deaths required to bring Nagash back to corporeal form. Interestingly though, Arkan showed a bit of mercy to her when he sacrifices her, promising her that he'll kill her in such a way that her spirit can't be raised again by him or Nagash. What that means he did to her, when not exactly sure. But why he did it seems to be that he's got this tiny little bit of humanity left, and she sensed it in him, saying that he still had some mercy. And finally on the list of special characters, although she does not appear on the tabletop, the Lady of the Lake will get a mention here too, because in the End Times fluff, she's revealed to have been Lilaeth, the elf goddess of dreams. Yeah, it turns out that not only was it those meddling elves mucking up everything the whole time, but their gods were the ones who got in on it too. I was actually okay with it when we were led to assume that it was Ariel, Queen of Athelorn, because that kind of makes sense. She's got a political reason to want to make sure that the men don't meddle with her forest. It makes some sense. So I'm still not sure how I feel about it being the elf goddess of dreams. But yeah, that's a, that's a thing. So there you have it folks, a rundown of the lore of Bretonia in a nutshell. Hopefully this will be a handy guide to those who want to know more about the land of chivalry and honour, and are more interested in the workings of the Warhammer world. There's not really all that much further reading for Bretonia apart from previous editions army books, though everything after 4th is the current version of Bretonia. Uh, there was one novel published by the Black Library that I know of called Knight of the Realm, but I didn't really like it all that much so your mileage may vary on that one. So this is the conclusion to the first video in a series that'll be about all of the factions eventually. So join me next time for our next adventure into the lore of Warhammer Fantasy with me, Grey Hunter.